practice in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the most merciful Savior, who came to us in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. We forever thank Almighty God Allah for raising in our midst a divine leader, teacher, and guide, the one that all of the prophets prophesied about, the one that all of them looked and prayed that they would be in that day when he came to the people of God to guide them back, that one who was raised in our midst, not by a mystery but God, but by God in person. When Allah came to us, he raised one from among us to prove and to show the power of the presence and the reality of his word and his promise. And that one that he raised in our midst is the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, the exalted Christ, the long-awaited Messiah of the black man and woman and of the world. All praise is due to Allah. Yes, I would applaud the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. I would applaud Allah for bringing him and guarding him and give praise and honor to him for that one is present in the world. And we forever thank Almighty God Allah and his Christ for giving us one last grace, one last mercy, one final call, one last chance that we might escape the promised destruction of the world that hated the God who created this earth. That's right. That's right. And we forever thank him and his Christ for leaving in our midst their divinely guided servant and the reminder of Allah and his Christ in our midst, the spirit of truth, the trumpet of truth, the one that Allah and his Christ said that would be given the power in the last days to guide his people into all truth. And that one is the Honorable Louis Farrakhan Muhammad. <laughs> we forever thank Almighty God Allah for giving us such beautiful and wonderful servants. And we would be remiss if we did not bear witness not only that he has sent us servants who serve him by delivering the word, but he has sent you and I to be servants of the servants in delivering the word to God's people. So give yourselves a warm round of applause and please take your seat. Thank you. You know, this is a happy day for all of us, and I say that sincerely because you know, as we struggle with the day-to-day -day difficulties of life, we sometimes lose sight of the bigger picture. You know, struggle is ordained, but we're not in this for the struggle. We're really in it for the victory, aren't we? I want to thank all of you before I briefly present to most of you and introduce to others our esteemed and distinguished brother and international representative of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan in the Nation of Islam, Brother Minister Abdul Akbar Muhammad. I would just like to remind you and to thank you, first of all, that our effort in Los Angeles with our charities has placed us in the position of being the number one helpers of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. send a special message to the agents and to those who like to give out information. You haven't seen anything yet. All praise is due to Allah. The help has come and it's going to get stronger because we're going to organize more. We're going to work harder. We're going to do more to help Allah and his apostle to help the people of God in the building of his kingdom. That's right. So I want to thank all of you, and some of you have been so wonderful 
in all that you're doing to help us at Mass number 27 to help the Apostle, that my heart goes out to you and your families for your sacrifice and your dedication. And as the brothers increase the Final Call newspaper, as we approach our goal of 40,000, we're not looking back. We really want to get to where we're at 100,000 final calls, every issue here in Los Angeles proper alone. Yes, sir. So I want to thank all of you and, and really encourage you to continue in the fine work that you're doing. Now, one caveat, one warning, that as we move forward to organize to help the apostle, then we know that the enemy is going to try to bust up us in our effort to be organized. Right. You stay organized. Because he doesn't believe, first of all, that you can do it. And second of all, once you start it, that you can continue to do it. I think we can prove to him that he's a liar, right? Yes, sir. The scripture says he's a liar, right? Yes, we just have to prove it to ourselves. <laughs> now, having said that, there's not enough that one could say about a beloved friend of the apostle of God. The Honorable Louis Farcon is placed in his seat by the Christ himself to represent or to represent him to the people. And he told him not to teach what he taught, but to teach the understanding of it, to teach the meaning of it, to give the people the depth and the breadth and the full scope of what I've given to you that is so profound, but yet they don't comprehend it. The dark, the light shined in the darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not, meaning our minds were dark to the light of truth. And we didn't accept it as it should have been accepted because we really didn't understand it. Well, when a man comes to help that one that the Christ has given his mission to, then that man is a friend of God because he is a friend of the man who is God's man. And ever since I can reflect on my young experience in the nation, and from the time I first learned of the Muslims, I wanted to be one. And I first learned of the Muslims when Muhammad Ali beat Sonny Liston. And I told my grandfather, I said, I was 13, I said, I want to be a Muslim. Boy, you can't be no Muslims. Muslims hate white people. <laughs> well, we know that's not the truth. We hate evil, regardless of its complexion. But we know that it was given to us in the form of a human flesh and that flesh is the Caucasian people. And they have spread that evil, but there's plenty of us who do it too. <laughs> so it's nothing personal. And we understand the magnitude of fighting against evil on a small degree. And as we come into this wisdom, we see the greater challenge that's in front of us and in us. And when God gives a helper to purify the people to his man, to his servant, that helper bears that load of helping to purify the people with the wisdom of God that he's given to his servant. Well, in Brother Minister Abdul Akbar Muhammad, you have that kind of man. Because ever since I've known the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, this man has been standing by his side as an aider and a helper in the redemption of the black man and woman throughout America and Africa and around the globe. All praise is due to Allah. You can't find the words to describe that kind of man, that kind of woman, because there is no word. Only thing that you can say is all praise is due to Allah. Right. Alhamdulillah. Yes, May Allah bless you. May he protect you. May he guard your step. May he go out with you and come in with you. May he put himself all around those who are his servants to get this word out to his people. And so our brother is dearly beloved. He is an esteemed brother who isn't esteemed just because we speak words of praise for him, but because he has demonstrated his love of black people through his work to help that one that Allah has anointed and appointed 
to be his help. So I want to thank you for being here, that you might get a blessing from one that Allah has anointed and appointed as an aider and a helper to his apostle, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. Brother Minister Abdul Akbar Muhammad has served in many capacities, but he's always been the right-hand man of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. And his mission that he's on now, presently, his assignment, is he's the international representative of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. That's a heavy title. And his work carries him all around the globe and throughout Africa. And he is principally responsible for the Ghana mission, which we have in Accra, Ghana. There's so much that he's going to share with us today because Ghana is hosting Save This Day in 1994. And he's come to tell us how you can start preparing also for 1994 to get to Ghana, Accra, Ghana. But, you know, there's a requirement that we had to acquaint Brother Minister with about Los Angeles. And that is that Los Angeles, L.A., is the passport to Ghana since we host Savior's Day 93. And we have a passport committee. And in order to get to Ghana, you have to make sure that you're at Savior's Day 1993 in Los Angeles, and we will certify your passport to Ghana. <laughs> so I say that jokingly, of course, but certainly we would hope that since you're in LA, you would be here for Savior's Day in October. But we are honored to have our esteemed and beloved brother who has had many experiences that he's going to share with us. And the subject that he's going to focus on is those who have failed to learn the lessons of the past, of history, are doomed. Those who have failed to learn the lessons of history are doomed. And so that is a very profound subject because he doesn't want you to be doomed. I believe our brother is here today to teach us how to, or help us in learning how to pass the lesson. But the test is really on each of us. I would like to present to you the international representative of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, our brother your brother, our servant, your servant, our helper, your helper. That one that Allah has given to the apostle to get the word of God to his people, not just in America, but around the world. The international representative of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, Brother Minister Abdul Akbar Muhammad. There's no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. First of all, I'd like to thank Allah for blessing me to be here with you this afternoon. And as always, I'd like to thank the leader of the Nation of Islam, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, for an opportunity once again to help him in the awesome responsibility that has been placed on his shoulder. I'd like to thank Brother Minister Ave Muhammad. Uh, Brother Captain Wali Muhammad, Brother Secretary Amin Muhammad, and Sister Captain Alice Tuex for your uh, invitation to be here, and it came at the last minute. Then I'd like to thank you very much for taking time out of your Sunday afternoon to be here, and I will try not to talk long. And as Brother Minister said, I came to tell you about uh, the Savior's Day in Ghana, but I want to take a minute to talk to you about the lessons of history. There's an axiom. An axiom is a statement that proves itself true within the statement that goes like this. 
those who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. And um, I thought as I traveled around the country to acquaint the Muslim community and our guests about our work in Africa, where I've been assigned by the leader of the Nation of Islam, that I would take time to talk about it because there's a history that we have lived in the Nation of Islam. And we always must be mindful of that history. You have to look over your shoulder. As a young Muslim, I learned about history, and I began to love the study of history because I always wanted to know what made us what we were today. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us, of all of your studies, history is most attractive and deserves all of your research as it develops the springs and the motives that act most powerfully on the destiny of men and women. And so history has to be studied. The white man knows this, but he has never taught us the value of history. And this is why our communities are in shambles right now. So he makes us to feel that history is learning dates and facts and names. And when we come to school, we don't see the relevance of it. So I couldn't stand history. That's what some people say. What is it all about? They want me to learn about George Washington, cut down a cherry tree, and went and never told a lie, and that was a lie, and about Abraham Lincoln was in a log cabin reading by a candlelight, and he loved black folks so much, and his heart went out, and that was a lie. And so you, you didn't get a feel for history. Plus, when we came to school, there was no black books in schools at all. And we were relegated in the history books to picking cotton or either playing basketball, football, or baseball. And that's the way the history books went. But there's a lesson in history that's a lesson in life. So I told Brother Minister Farrakhan I was honored to be at his table uh, last week and then this past Thursday. And I told him that as I go around the country to talk to the believers and their guests about our work in Ghana to give you an overview of what we hope to accomplish on the African continent, because this is the first time in the uh, history of the nation of Islam that someone from America has been assigned to work in Africa. And believe me, I feel that it will make a difference in the nation. So I told the minister that I would like to take 15 or 20 minutes to talk about the lessons of history, because the future of the nation, and one thing that we have to have in the nation is continuity, and continuation. There must be continuity and continuation. And I want to say that uh, one thing that you see in the nation, uh, Sister uh, Minister Aisha Muhammad, you see our sisters coming out to speak. You heard Sister Ava uh, last week, one of the most profound teachers in the nation for Brother Minister Farrakhan, along with Sister Tynetta Muhammad. And in each mosque, all three. across the country, we're developing a cadre of women who will be in the ministry and help to speak this word. Now, that represents the future, this continuity, the continuation of the nation. And it shows another thing. When the Honorable Elijah Muhammad started back in the 30s, we used to have women ministers. But the black man had been put under so much by the white man that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wanted to bring him out. Our women have been the foundation and the strength of us since we've been in America. They stood by us. During the days of slavery, and this is why this must be taught and it must be talked in a family. Um, during the days of slavery, it was our women that was really the foundation pillar of the whole family. They held things together. And this is why I'm saying to my young brothers, these people talk about love is not about color. This is why when you go out and get the white woman, you got the slave master's daughter neglecting the black woman who needs a strong black man, and you running after the slave master's daughter. It don't make sense. It's an insult to us as a people. So, you know, they... One young brother said, well, you live in a di we live in a different time, man. Today, we don't do that. We just go after what's out there. But no, if you had a, a sense of history and understood history, you would never do it. Because this black woman has been through too much for us now to put her to the side and be walking down the street with Sally, stringy-haired Sally, the white man's daughter. No. 
And you say, well, that's the way to get back at the white man. That's not the way to get back at the white man. If you want to get back at the white man, have some babies, take care of them, and take care of the black woman that brings them into the world. I want to, uh, I want to say this, and uh, I cannot talk too long. Um, you know, I'm used to, instead of going four hours a day, I only go three hours and 45 minutes. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I hope to speak just one hour. And I want to state my reason, and then I'd like to go into this lesson from history. Um, I'm here to talk about, number one, the Ghana mission, to cover briefly some aspects of the Minister Savior's Day uh, lecture that I think is important for our entire community. Uh, I want to talk about, uh, I had a heart problem in Ghana in January, and uh, Allah blessed me to survive it, and I'm here today because uh, Allah's will, number one, and some good moves by some of my brothers. And then, at the end of the meeting, I'd like you to participate and help us uh, in a fundraiser for the African mission. And I know that in the nation, we're always raising funds. So I told Brother Minister, instead of me taking donations, I brought some gifts from Africa that I'd like to share with you and then uh, and let you look at some of the work that we're doing. So those are the reasons that I'm here. Now let me try to, you know, I'm from New York City, and uh, in New York we do everything fast, so I talk a little fast, okay? And uh, you know, when I first came, the, my first trip to California was 1970, I think 70. And I was basically on the East Coast. But I remember when I came out here, we used to always say that California was so wild because it was the end. See, when the white man sweeped across America, fought the Indians through the plain, crossed the Rocky Mountains, and reached the West Coast, he couldn't go any further to do any more evil. So everything stopped right here. And everything that he wanted to do happened out here. But California, being three hours behind New York, always wanted to play catch up. Now, this is not, this is not a put down. I want you to listen. So you always went to the extremes in everything that you did. If we started it in New York, you finished it in California. And so I come from New York, and I talk fast. So I'm going to go through this history a little fast, and I just want you to stay with me because we want to try to get out of the mosque at a certain hour. Is that clock in the back right? or No, it's not. What, Brother Captain, what time is it? 325. 325, okay. So if you could give me uh, one hour, and then I'd like to open questions to the floor, and then we'll try to make this quickly. Those who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. In 1977, Minister Farrakhan was going through certain changes because he tried to help the new leadership of the Nation of Islam after the Honorable Elijah Muhammad left us in 1975. Um, but he couldn't. He just couldn't, couldn't gel. He tried. And I'm a witness that he tried. And so he was in um, Washington, D.C. for the inauguration of Jimmy Carter. And we met with Alex Haley, who told him that James Baldwin was writing a script for Malcolm's film, the autobiography of Malcolm. Um, and uh, they were looking for someone to play it, and Minister Farrakhan would be the perfect one. So he came to California, and they talked about him playing it. So in 77, or the end of 76, Minister Farrakhan agreed that he would play Malcolm as long as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was projected right in that film. So I want you to know the phenomenon of, uh, of uh, Spike Lee making this Malcolm film is nothing new. And you have to know that the book, the autobiography of Malcolm, was not Malcolm's idea, but it was an idea from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now, I'm going to talk about it briefly, but inshallah, I hope by Savior's Day, 19. 93 in Los Angeles, California, that my book on the nation of Islam's history will be completed. I, I so, let, me, let me go through this. I'm going to go through this quickly. So, Minister Farrakhan came out here. He talked to James Baldwin, who was living in France at that time, happened to be out here. He gave him a copy of the book. And uh, Minister Farrakhan agreed that this is what he wanted to do because he was going to go back into his music because he could not gel properly with the new leadership in the nation of Islam because the Imam Warathin Muhammad was an unknown entity, Minister Farrakhan was a known entity, and they felt they had to bury him in order to make the Imam known, okay? It was a political move. So Minister Farrakhan, and at the time I was the Imam's special assistant, and my job was to assign ministers around the country or Imams. 
And I tried to keep Minister Farrakhan close to work with the Imam because the Imam really needed him because of Minister Farrakhan's ability and his notoriety in this country. But it didn't work out. So in February of 77, a set of circumstances happened in Chicago um, that I had to stay off the roster for 30 days. And um, the circumstances where they were a group of brothers in the mosque who always wanted a position. Remember, in the Nation of Islam, we have four main positions, minister, captain, secretary, and sister captain. And sometimes brothers and sisters think if you don't have one of those positions, you really have nothing to do. I was so proud of Brother Minister Abe Muhammad when he showed me a structure downstairs of things that you can do in the structure of the mosque to utilize your skills and service. That's very important. So you don't have to think, I got to be the minister, the captain, the secretary, the sister captain. And if you don't get that post, you just create hell in the mosque and we can't even function because you're always giving us a problem. So there was a group of brothers in the mosque that felt that way. And so when the imam set up committees, they wanted to change everything. So one of them called us some sissies, and I'm from New York, so I told him, but he used the other word, he called us some faggots, and I said, we don't play that. And I gave him some choice words, and so the imam said, oh, Brother Aziz, you can't say that to people. So they sent me down for 30 days. Minister Farrakhan got an invitation from Idi Amin to come to Uganda. So he came to me and asked me did I want to go with him, because Idi Amin had always loved the nation of Islam. Don't believe these Zionist-controlled films about Idi Amin was a big monster eating his people and all of that. Idi Amin loved black people. In 1973, he invited the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to come to Morocco, okay? You following me now? You're going to stay with me, okay? So Minister Farrakhan said, look, uh, Aziz was my name at the time. Would you come to Uganda with me? I asked the Imam. He said, fine, you can go. Plus, I was off the roster. I couldn't speak for 30 days anyway. So we left that February, we flew to London, and then we flew to a, a conference in Cairo, and Idi Amin had his plane to pick us up and brought us to Uganda. We went to Uganda, we stayed there 22 days. One day while we were there, we were at Idi Amin's home in Entebbe, you know, where they had the raid on Entebbe, he had a home there, and in Kampala, so we were at his home. Minister Farrakhan took out the book and said that there's a project that we feel will help Islam in America, and it's the life of Malcolm X. We have a chance to make this film, but we want to control it. So those brothers in Hollywood who want to put the film out need the finance. Amin said, I don't have the money. I, I, it's a good idea. Amin being a Muslim himself, he said, it's a good idea, but I don't have the money. He said, but I got a friend who has the money. Let me call him. So right there while we stand, he picked up the phone and he called Brother Gaddafi and said, Brother Gaddafi, I got a friend here I want you to meet. They have a project that I would like you to look into. I think it is a good project. You know, in his Ugandan accent, he was telling Brother Gaddafi, Brother Gaddafi said, fine, send him to Libya. So um, we got on a plane, we went to Khartoum in the Sudan, and then we flew to Libya. When we got to Libya, we went to our hotel. You're sticking with me now, I want you to follow him. So Gaddafi had made arrangements for us to meet him at the airport the next morning because he was going to Tobruk, which is the base where he had kicked the British out, and they were having a celebration there. And uh, so we got up early that morning, we were in the lobby, we were waiting, and the driver came, we were supposed to be there at 8 o'clock, the driver showed up at 8.15. And the driver happened to be from Ghana, where I live at now. And the driver said to us, don't worry, everything in this country is always late, you'll be on time. So we rushed to the airport, when we got to the airport, the plane was taken off. And so we missed Brother Gaddafi, and he left two aides there to say, well, they waited as long as they could, but they had to leave, and uh, he told me to talk to you about your project. So we went back into Tripoli, we sat down and we talked about the project, and uh, they said fine, and we left and went on to Mecca, where we made Umrah and attended a conference. Now, I'm saying all of that to say that if Minister Farrakhan, who had said he was going to back up from teaching, if we would have saw Gaddafi that day, and Gaddafi would have probably given us the money for this project, because that's the kind of brother he is, he had already helped the Nation of Islam in 1972, he gave the Honorable Elijah Muhammad $3.6 million to buy the mosque in Chicago. So he was already attempting to help the nation, and we were going to show him how this project was worthy of his help. But Allah did not permit it. God is the best knower. Right. And because if Minister Farrakhan would have received the money, we got back to California, came out here, saw the filmmakers, gave them the money, we would have put the film together. Minister Farrakhan would have probably been into acting and his music right now. But being that God didn't allow that to happen, Minister Farrakhan ended up on another path, and that's rebuilding the nation of Islam, okay? Allah So, I'm 
I'm stating this to try to make you see something in the history of circumstances and time. 1977, Minister Farrakhan started right out here in Los Angeles when Brother Jabril gave him the book and he said that he wanted to rebuild the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He went to work to rebuild that work and the nation is what you see it today. Now we have to look at the history of that development. You have to be able to look at the mistakes you made and be honest. Our young people need guidance today. When you look at the streets of the cities in America, they need guidance. What kind of guidance do they need? It's obvious that the white man is not going to give them the guidance to build constructive lives. It is obvious, even though the propaganda in America is that because some brothers are selling some crack on the corner, that it is the root of a multi-billion dollar business, which is a total lie. It has to be people involved in it on a total different level. One of the biggest signs that we should have seen as a people is when DeLorean ran into trouble with his car factory in, in, the, in Europe and he decided to turn him a cocaine deal because he needed a quick $50 million. Now that was one that came to the surface, but it happens every day in white America. Drugs is not just what you see on the corner in the black community as the white man wants you to, but drugs is a big million dollar business controlled by the government of America, number one, because the CIA has been involved in drugs and it came out in the Noriega trial and also large corporations in drugs. So we become the scapegoat. We are the criminals and uh, Bush uh, earmarked the $4 to build more prisons, not to try to solve the problem, but to lock up young black people across this country. So now we have to look at the lesson that history teaches us. One of the greatest lessons in history is the opium wars in China. The white man wanted into He couldn't get in because it was a closed society. So the Dutch, the Americans brought in, uh, and the British, uh, the Dutch, the British, and the Americans brought opium into China. And they got the young Chinese men from the age of 16 to 45 smoking opium. They were growing it on plantation controlled by the British in India. They were shipping it in. And then Chinese men who became corrupt and loved silver and money more than the flesh and blood of their own people, they were the ones that were selling the opium to their own, own people. And when a Chinese man or boy got strung out on opium, he would sell everything that he had in order to get this smoke. Also, it took the fight out of them. It took the drive out of them. It took the desire for family structure. It made them a disrespecter of morals and society. It destroyed the Chinese society, and the Westerners were able to get in. And it wasn't until what you know in history as the Boxer Rebellions or the Boxer Wars, it wasn't until the Chinese people themselves say that we must put an end to the menace in our society. So that is a lesson in history. If we're waiting for the white man to solve the problems of our community, it will never happen. But there has to be some organization. There has to be some group that comes together that will say we must put an end to it. It's not going to be the masses of our people. It's going to be those dedicated few who realize that we must be the same society. I would say to the brothers in the community that we see that force as the nation of Islam. We see that the nation of Islam has the ability that we can solve this problem. We must solve this problem. I spoke at a funeral three weeks ago in St. Louis, and it, and it was a big funeral. 2,000 people, a woman was killed, 69 years old, by her grandson. Stabbed 14 times because she would not give him money to buy crack killed his grandmother, and then took her car and hopped it to the crack dealer. And everybody that got up in the church talked about what a wonderful woman. They stayed away from the issue. I got up there and said, no, there's a problem in this community. This woman is laying dead here because our young people are being destroyed by this drug that white people have poured into our community, that they make available in our community. And until we come together to stop this problem, it will destroy the fabric of our entire community. We must organize to do it in big place. Right. I was so proud to hear from the captain here about the NOI security where how many men have been put to work. We got to put our young brothers to work and show that you can earn a decent living doing an honest day's work. We got to show them that there's more than what's in the street, that it doesn't make you anything. You know, as you got a reef in your mouth, that's from one end and fool on the other. 
I don't care if it's like a short man thinking that you're going to put on heels to become tall. When you go home at night, you got to take those shoes off and you come down to the size that you are. So it's a problem in our community that we must solve. It's a problem that we must look at. We must look at how we can get into the young people. We got to spend quality time with them. We can't throw them out to the world and think that they're going to grow up. So you have to learn the lessons of history. If we've been through that and we know it's no good, then we got to share it with the young people. You can't share it in a fit of rage or anger. You got to sit down at a dinner table. The elders in our community, you may not be perfect. You're not perfect. You got faults. But it doesn't mean because you got faults, you don't sit down with these young brothers and sisters and tell them about the rigors of life and what they face in the white man's world. We want Islam involved in the future. of We are concerned when we go to jails and see the, them stacked in their rafters of young people who are in the penal system. Reverend Charles Cohen, you, I don't know if you know his name, he's doing 12 years in prison right now. I went to see him for some crime that they charged him. During 1968, he formed the Black Liberators that fought against white folks in St. Louis and Southern Illinois. And they waited all of these years to get him, and they locked him up on some trumped-up charges. I went to prison to see him. You read his column in Final Call for a while, then we had to pull it out because the prison authorities didn't want him writing in the most outspoken black paper in the country. When I went to prison, he gave me this lesson. He said, Akbar, let me tell you what they're doing to these young brothers and sisters. They're turning out snitches wholesale. They get them in jail, and they make them into snitches. White man tell them you're facing 25 years. You better take a plea bargain. Your mama ain't got no money. She already hocked her house to get that no good lawyer she got for you. But all you got to do is give us up a few people. These are the crimes on our books we try to solve. This happened in your neighborhood. You know who did it? Give us some names. Turning you into snitches and what we'll do instead of giving you 25, we'll give you five years and you might get out on parole in three. And see, so you giving it up to the white man in order to save your own rusty behind and he's turning the whole community into a group of snitches. And he's telling them that if you go and spy on them, there's an article in the day's New York Times. And if you got the New York Times in Los Angeles, it's on the capture of Butterfly. It's about a, a woman who they say is a, a South American woman, but she's really a Jew who was involved in heavy, heavy drug business. And in that article, because Judge Hastings, a black judge in Florida that white folks tried to lynch, that he tried that case, but in there, they talk about the snitch game and how they turned out a snitch. And there was one man who they used, and he had all kind of problems, all kind of problems, they used him against his own people to be a snitch. That's what they're doing in the black community. You got a classic in Los Angeles where a man filmed brother involved in some activity and then turned it over to the police. They get the brothers to plea bargain and to cop out and turn you into snitches and then you become a shell of a man. You can never face yourself because you sent your brother to prison, some of it even on trumped up charges. This is not just isolated cases. This is going on across the, uh, America and it's designed to destroy the trust factor in the black community. They have come into the nation of Islam with that same thing. In New York City, there was a brother who was involved in some illegal activity. And when the police raided our mosque, when Minister Farrakhan was the minister there, the police raided our mosque and one police ended up dead. He, he may have shot himself. He saw all them brothers running down them steps talking about a law walk bar, and he had his gun and he looked at that and shot himself in the head. That was his business. But they got a brother, they got a brother in the mosque that was involved in some illegal activity who was facing 25 years. They said, all you got to say is that you were on the scene and saw this man that we uh, captured shoot this officer and we can work with you. Put him on the payroll. Put him in the witness protection program. So you got to learn about that. I'm saying this to these young brothers, because if you stay in that street life, in that crime life, the white man will make a sissy out of you. He'll turn you out. And then you won't be able to face yourself. This is what he'll do to you. They gave this brother money, paid him salary every week, and brought him into court to testify against his own brother to save his no good behind. And you know what happened? They lost the case anyway. They lost the case anyway. Now this man is nothing. Today. He's a bum. He's in the street because he cannot face himself because of what he did to his own brother. Now, I'm just saying, this, these are the lessons of history. I want to share them with you. So when we sit down with our young people, a father should never say to a son or a daughter, well, you got to experience that because I went through it. 
Well, I went through it for you. It's no good. You don't have to go through it. I already have done that. And it does not work. Take it from me. The mistakes that we have made in our life, what are they for? They're history. So you got to share that part of history with your own children. And that's the way you make them a better individual. We have a history in the nation. We've made some mistakes. We haven't done everything right. But if we don't utilize the mistakes that we have made to help those coming behind us, then what is it all about? We have to share them. Say, brother, we tried that before. It does not work. Brother, you can't do that because we are law-abiding citizens. We must do what is correct. Brother, you can't do that to a sister. This represents the future. She's producing the children that represent the future of this society. She needs a strong man by her side, not a weak man. He needs a faithful woman, not an unfaithful woman. This is what we need to build a wholesome society. We have to learn what it is to work with one another. You got to learn how to disagree without becoming disagreeable. You got to learn how to close doors on yesterday. A book called The Greatest Salesman in the World, the greatest thing that's in that book is how to close doors on yesterday. But if something happens yesterday and you keep the door open all the time, you can't see the future and work on the future. You got to be able to close that door and not keep opening it up and looking back into it and judging a person on a mistake that they may have made yesterday. This is the only way you can build a wholesome society. So these are the lessons from history. And we have to learn these lessons in order to build and go to the future. Now I want to share something with you that I feel personally is very important for the development of the nation and our society. And one thing that I, and the reason that I want to share this with you is because we have to look at it. In West Africa, there was a civilization called the Ghana Empire. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that 50,000 years ago, one of our scientists wanted to master the life in what is called East Asia at that time, the day called Africa. He left what is called the root of civilization. Those brothers who are studying Egyptology talk about the, that's where civilization started. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that a long time ago. The brother who talked against the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Dr. Ben Jacobin or Johanan, he became a Muslim in 1986. Many people don't know that, that he accepted Islam. Because in his books, he attacked Islam. One of the scholars called Chancellor William in the destruction of black civilization the uh, tax Islam because they didn't know the root of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that Islam is not 1400 years ago and Islam did not start 1400 years ago after Prophet Muhammad made a peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. But Islam has always been here. It was the natural way of the black man. He said 50,000 years ago, one of our scientists wanted to master the life of the jungles of Africa and took his family and moved down into that area. And they stayed there 50,000 years. Before that, they were into what we know today as Islam. But our religion didn't have to have a name because it was the natural way of the black man. It's like when you say a spider, you automatically know he spins a web. You never say a, a spider, a web spinning spider. When you say spider, you know exactly what he does. When you said black man, that he lived in the law of Islam, it was the natural way of life. So when this all oh, oh, crazy people are about, so when this scientist decided that he wanted to master that life, they moved into the jungles of Africa. They lost the knowledge of a lot of things, but they built civilization there, and they lived there for 50,000 years. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that that was to prepare us for what we would endure or undergo for 400 years under this white man in America. But as we lived that life in the jungles of Africa, uh, we built civilizations there before the spread of Islam. Then Islam spread into that area from traders. One of the first civilizations, Ghana, was headed by a man named Sunni Ali Bir. But he was really not a good Muslim, though he had a Muslim name, but he was more into traditional religion but he had to play the two between. But he built a strong civilization called the Ghana Empire. Behind him uh, came the uh, Songhe Empire and the Mali Empire. In this empire, there was a man named Askia Muhammad who came to the throne. He built the civilization. He had a division of labor. Uh, he was a good Muslim. He built for Islam. And then when he became older, now this is history, when he became an older man, uh, the, they tried to move him off the throne, but nobody could do the work that he did, and everything fell apart. And it wasn't until Mansa Musa came to power 
and Mansa Musa begin to rebuild the work. Now, Mansa Musa is known in history 670 years ago. He took 10,000 black Muslims to Mecca. He went through Cairo, Egypt. He inflated the Egyptian gold market. But when he went to Mecca and made this great pilgrimage, he brought learned people back to help him in West Africa and built the civilization in West Africa that is still talked about to this day. White people learned about it basically through a man called Leo Africanus. Leo African countries in the world, and the 80th country that I visited was the country of Tunisia just last November. But 80 countries in the world, but in this country, when I got to Jerba, the history of um, Hussein ibn Muhammad was his name. He was born in Spain uh, in 1492 when Isabel and Ferdinand uh, destroyed the last Muslim stronghold in what was called Andalusia. He was family was driven out. They went back to live in North Africa. He was a very learned individual. Some pirates captured him, as the white man is always capturing people and making them slaves when they have a darker color. They took him to Italy, gave him to Pope Leo X. Pope Leo X took him, renamed him after they converted him to Christianity. And when I was a young Muslim, I used to always say it's hard to convert a Muslim to Christianity. But now living in Africa, I see a whole lot of Muslims that have been converted because they don't have a knowledge base that's sufficient enough to keep them in Islam and they end up becoming Christian. But he became a Christian. And when he became a Christian, he shared with them the knowledge and the history of West Africa and the civilizations that existed in West Africa. Now, most scholars say that the Arabs came into West Africa and spread Islam. That's how the Muslims, who are black people in Africa, became Muslims. Follow me. But we know that they were Muslims a long time ago, that they believed in oneness of God, that they believed in God. But they were away from that. And when Islam came back, it was like something they found that they had lost. On March the 1st, the New York Times had an article about the Spanish people accepting Islam in Spain. And I met with some of them in North Africa. And they told me that they had heard Islam through a sheikh from England, but the real reason that many of them accepted Islam, they found out through history that many of their parents were Muslims, but when Islam was destroyed in Spain, they had to go underground and stop practicing Islam. They could only practice it in private, and secrecy, and so many of them ended up growing up in the Christian faith, but when they found that they were once Islam, they accepted it. And when they accepted Islam, it was like something they were looking for all of their lives. This you see in modern science when they say that today, if you start drinking, 60% of the people who start drinking that had alcoholic parents will become alcoholics, because when they start drinking, it's like something they were looking for all of their lives. Those who were born of parents who had drug problems, unless there's some guidance and control in their life and they don't get involved in drugs, if they start using drugs, a young man in New York told me when I started using drugs, it was like something I was looking for all of my life because the genetic coding from his parents who used substance was in his system and when he started using it, it was like something that he was looking for. What am I saying? That when you found Islam, you said it was like something I was looking for all of my life. It gave me the strength to put down bad habits. When you heard Minister Farrakhan, when you heard him blazing and you listened to him, you were mesmerized by what he was saying, and there was a feeling that came over you, a feeling of something that you had been looking for. That is because historically your roots were there, and it was something that was out of your life that you needed in your life, and you could feel it as he delivered the message. Well, so it is. And what is happening today, that's why we say that Islam has no beginning nor ending. We have always been in Islam. So today, when you hear Islam, it's like something that you've been searching for all of your life, something that you've been looking for. When the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was with us, he taught across this country, especially from 1934 to 1942, when he went up and down the East Coast, when he was on the move, when the government was after him, and those who didn't think that he should have the leadership, he planted the seed of Islam in the minds of many of your relatives and parents. It did not germinate in them, but you were produced. And when you came out, that same seed, that genetic coding was there from the message that they heard. 
Your mother may have heard Minister Farrakhan or Malcolm X years ago. She didn't become a Muslim, but she always felt the strength of that message was in her soul. It was a part of her. And when you were produced and heard the message, you gravitated towards that message because that coding was in you as an individual. So I'm saying that if God has blessed you and you feel it, and you're halting between two decisions, you want to join the nation, you're analyzing what's happening in the nation, how the brothers function, what they do, can you trust the minister, is he a good man, can you work with the captain, see all of that you wrestling with in your own mind, what I say to you, go find something better out there, we may not be perfect, but we the best you can find out there right now, all three of you are So, Islam, as it's established in America today, and all of these articles that are appearing in magazines since the bombing in New York, there's an attack on Islam. And that attack on Islam is not only on Arab, but it's on Islam in general. I got a newspaper article here that while I was flying here from the East Coast this morning, I, let me see what newspaper it's in. It's in the Denver Post. I stopped in Denver and picked up a paper. <clears throat> and it says, let us pray and to pray P-R-E with why, like you pray on something. And they got all of these buzzards, you know. The buzzard is one that knows that something's going to die. And he just flies around and waits on the evil accident of time. And on this, now this is very interesting. I just saw this this morning when I was making notes for my subject. On this, they have all of these buzzards sitting up here. And the first buzzard they call all of the buzzards loonies. The first buzzard, it says Islamic loonies. The second buzzard is Christian loonies because it is David Koresh down there in the Waco, Texas. The third one is a Hindu loony, a Sheikh loony, a Jewish loony, Protestant, and a Catholic loony. But the first one up there is Islam. And it's an attack on Islam because they realize the power of Islam as it spreads in the black community. Every Islamic group out there today that is a black man or woman in America, the root of them being in Islam, if they've never been in the nation of Islam, is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He's responsible for that. They know that Minister Farrakhan is a champion among young people in America. They know, like um, Public Enemy, who was recently in Africa with uh, Malik Farrakhan, who's standing back there on the wall. Because Chuck D and the brothers put Minister Farrakhan's name in their rap tune, Minister Farrakhan's word has spread among young people across this country. They know the power of the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to discipline and change the lives of young men and young women across this country. They know the attracting power of Islam, and they know also that Islam frees their mind from the slave mentality that they're locked into white America, looking up to white America, worshiping the white man, thinking that he's all powerful and all good. They know that Islam breaks that stronghold, and it doesn't break it and they're wild and crazy in the street killing one another, but it breaks it and gives them a discipline that becomes a governor factor in their life and makes them an asset instead of a liability in the black community. So therefore, their job is to try to stop that spread of Islam in the black community among the young black people. Spread confusion. Make the Muslims appear as they're arguing and fighting with one another. And I would say to all of my Muslim brothers, look, you have nothing to prove when you're the winner. Right. It's like, you know, those who are the distractors of the nation of Islam got this little group or that little group and do not go for the work of Minister Farrakhan. You don't have to argue with them. See, when they argue with us, we are... We got the strongest standing army in this country. God has blessed Minister Farrakhan to be the most visible Muslim leader, not just a Muslim leader, but a leader for black America across this country. They know that they see the hand of God on him every time he opens his mouth. Look, so when you're in that position, you don't have to shout back at those distractors. They're like dogs barking at the moon. See, it's only a problem when the moon answers the dog that's barking at it. So we don't have to answer that. All we have to do is keep on rolling. And what the white man wants to produce, and he tried it through the Malcolm film, he wanted to produce bloodshed in the street with people fighting against members of the Nation of Islam. And once the bloodletting starts, it's difficult to stop it, and the white man knows it. But he plans. 
and Allah plans, and Allah is the best of plans. He planned it that way, but it didn't happen that way. He wanted the film to do something that didn't happen, didn't even make all his money back. And the look, I mean, I don't know Spike Lee personally, and I think that he may have been as sincere in his attempt, but there were white factors that were in control there. There was one part of the film where they showed Malcolm reading the newspaper about the wives of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and calling them women while he was in the nation. That was a lie. There was a part in the film where he showed Malcolm in a jail cell and the uh, uh, vision of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad came. If you read the autobiography, that was a lie. In the film, he never showed Malcolm with the connection of black Africa. Malcolm spent his 39th birthday in the country of Ghana, but they didn't show that in the film because they never want you to connect with Africa because they know that what you have, that you have learned in America can benefit Africa and help the whole continent. So they didn't want that connection through the film. So they hoped to do something with the film. I started off by telling you that the film was not a bad idea because Minister Farrakhan was going to play Malcolm himself. But when white folks get in control, they wanted to turn it around because they realized that Minister Farrakhan has become the strongest leader in this country, giving direction to black people, even those who do not join the Nation of Islam, look to him as the premier leader in black America. So I wanted to say that to you because as the Muslim community, there are certain things that you have to study. How many heard part two of his Savior's Day address? How many heard the tape of part two? Now, in part two, the minister goes into greater detail, yes, yes, and you yes. need to hear it, because people challenge you, and it doesn't have to be an argument. That's why the Holy Quran says, argue with them in the best manner. The word sound in the ears of Allah is the brain of acid. And when somebody gets into an argument, you don't have to go into your karate stand and, and I'll punch you in the mouth, but what you got to do is present an argument. But you have to have a sufficient knowledge base in order to argue. But if you don't have no knowledge, knowledge base, then you got to get physical. It's like a uh, sister when you argue with your husband sometimes, or you catch him on a point, and sometimes your mind is just sharper than his. And then, brother, you want to punch her in the mouth because she got a score on you. No, what you got to do is come up with a knowledge base to defeat her argument, or either submit and say, baby, you're absolutely right. I won't make that mistake again. All praise to you for our Lord. But if your knowledge base is shallow, you say, yeah, say that again and see what I do for you. As Minister Farrakhan said, you want to work in her mouth like a dentist. So, no, you can't do that. So you have to have the proper knowledge base. Now, I want to just go over this quickly. I know my time is running. I hope you can stay with me. You know, I tell you I talk fast. In 1989, Minister Farrakhan was in the, the country of Ghana. Uh, I had received an invitation for him to come to Ghana when I was traveling in Africa to speak at the 80th birthday celebration of Kwame Nkrumah. So Minister Farrakhan decided to come. We were there in 1986, and the minister swept the country by a storm. Thirteen days in Ghana, he was in the front of the newspaper every single day. The head of state then, who was called Chairman Rollins, he's the president now, he heard from his intelligence sources that he shouldn't let Minister Farrakhan in the country. But he wanted to hear him for himself, so he let him in. And when he heard Minister Farrakhan, he said that this is a noble messenger of God. He brings a message to the people, and he opened up every door in Ghana for us. On leaving, he asked Minister Farrakhan to open up an office in Ghana for the Nation of Islam, because what he saw of the nation, he wanted that duplicated in his own country. So, all praise to you, all right. So when Minister Farrakhan was leaving, he promised, this was in 1986, he promised the chairman that he would open an office. So we came back to America, and he was preparing Dr. Khaled Muhammad to go to Ghana, and then Brother Khaled got into some, to some difficulty that the authorities locked him up, and Khaled could not go. So in 1989, when we returned, uh, the chairman, in a meeting, we were sitting in a, a private house that the chairman had provided for Minister Farrakhan and his delegation. The chairman said, Brother Farrakhan, I'm calling on you to fulfill your promise you made to me in 1986. At that time, I had already had uh, open heart surgery, and I was really going to Africa to study and to teach uh, the, the history of the struggle of black America and study Arabic, French, Islamic literature, and finish the biography of Minister Farrakhan in my other book. So I was about to move. I was going to leave. That was in September. I was leaving that January. I was going to another country in Africa. So when the chairman asked the minister to fulfill his promise, the minister turned to me. I was sitting there, and he said, well, uh, chairman, 
I would like uh, to ask Brother Akbar, who is about to move to Africa anyway, would he move to Ghana instead of where he was going to go? And he said, would you do that, Brother Akbar? You know, I said, of course. Yes, sir, Brother Minister. And that's how I got to Ghana. And uh, by that November, I was looking for a house. By that February, I found a house, and then I moved into Ghana uh, and opened up our office. That's how we started in Ghana. Now, thank you. Now, after I got to Ghana and began to look at the landscape and began to work, there were certain things that I felt had to be done before we really got full swing. One thing that we had to do is to create a base there. Acceptance is no problem. When I came back to America, I went after acceptance. In six lectures, we got about 257 people to join up. They want to be members of the nation. But in Ghana, you got to lay an economic base because you got to put them to work. So we kind of put them on holy. We have their forms because 80% of the people do not work. And as the Christians go in, they dig wells, they give out pens and pencils, they do different things, set up a computer school, training school for women, and we have to do the same thing on the African continent. It's almost a must. Uh, the respect level for the nation of Islam, when you get there in 1994, inshallah, you'll see how the people love and respect the nation of Islam and its leader, Minister Louis Farrakhan. So uh, all praise is due to Allah. I have some witnesses in the off, uh, audience of what I'm about to say. One of the things when you go to Ghana, and I've taken 11, 10 delegations. My 11th is coming up this July. Um, I took Dionne Warwick. I came out here to California about a year ago. I met with her. She had called because she has a design and reconstruction company, and she wanted to do some work on a project that Minister Farrakhan had in St. Kitts. And when I was talking to her about it, I said, well, I'll give that information to the minister. I said, well, Dion, why don't you come to Africa? And uh, she said, I don't know about that. I said, there's some work that your construction company can do there. And she said, well, maybe we can talk about it. Can you come to California? I came, I talked to her, and she agreed to come to Ghana. She said, but I'd like to bring Isaac Hayes, my good buddy. And I said, fine. So we made arrangements. She came to Ghana. She went through the slave dungeons that we took public enemy through. And when she came out, she cried. And she said that Akbar, she said that young people must see this. They must go through it. And when she said it, it reminded me of the Jews taking their young children to Germany, to Europe, every summer to walk them through Hitler's death camps. And what they do is help the young people develop focus in their life. They said that this is what uh, was about to happen to you as a people. Someone tried to annihilate you, to destroy you as a people. And this is why you must achieve in every field of knowledge, in every field of business, of endeavor medicine, science, law, technology. And the Jews, are, are, they pushed their children in that direction to be achievers because they were once almost destroyed as a people. Once you go through the slave dungeons of Ghana, and Ghana happens to have the two largest in all of Africa, once you walk through them, and Brother Farrakhan, you can bear witness and feel they, what's in them. And uh, I think Brother Cornelius, who was here, uh, Brother Cornelius is in the audience, he was in Ghana. And he walked to anybody else in the audience here that was on our tours in Ghana that went through the slave dungeon. Once you go through them and feel what happened to our brothers and sisters, to see how they put the men, crowded them all together, threw food down to them, made them fight for food. They had to stay in those holes six weeks to three months waiting for a ship to come. Then they chained the men together and the women were kept separate. Then they brought the women and the men together and put them in the holes of ships and shipped them to America, you got to see how that took place. The feeling of it to be there can change the course in your life. Dion and Isaac cried. And she said, Akbar, the first thing that I got to do is get back and bring my sons first and my friends so that they can experience what I have experienced here. In my uh, two and a half years in Ghana, I know that that trip through those slave dungeons have affected all of the young people that have come there. If I had, if I was a very, very wealthy man, all of our young bucks in the street who have no aim and purpose in their life, who need guidance, who may not have a man or a mother at home, a father figure that can bring guidance in their life, I would love them to make that journey so that they can see for themselves that God blessed you to survive this. If you survive this, then there must be something divine about your existence and you're still alive and functioning. So we're in Ghana working on this. My trip around the country is to tell you about your trip to Ghana. And I'm with Brother Minister Abe. We must make Los Angeles 
a resounding success at our Savior's Day, October 1993. I just left Atlanta, Georgia, and Brother Minister Van said that we had the greatest Savior's Day in the history of the nation, and he was right. 55,000 people. So now, you know what they say, can you beat this? Yeah. So now, what you have to do in Los Angeles, you have to beat that. You got to top it. That's right. So, um, as you move towards 1993, we want you to prepare your mind for 1994. Yes. And the reason that we are starting early is because this is not like getting on a plane and flying to Chicago. I mean, you're leaving the west coast of America, and your trip is longer than anyone else, and going to Africa. You have to prepare for it. Those who can't see the amount of money that it takes to make it happen, you got to start saving and putting money on the side for it right now. You have to get your passports. you got to get shots. But you got to prepare for it. It's the journey of a lifetime. It will be the greatest thing since Mansa Musa took 10,000 people to Mecca 670 years ago. It will be the greatest thing since they tried to ship the slaves back to Sierra Leone and Liberia. This, this convention in 1994 will rock the world. Not only will it rock the African continent, but it will rock the world. And so the nation of Islam has to prepare for it. So I would hope that you would prepare for it. Let me just cover two more things and then I want to go into our last part of the meeting. In 1987, I believe, or 88, I went to New Zealand. And, um, you know, I traveled a lot, but I went there on a trip. I stopped in uh, Fiji, um, then I went to Tahiti, and then to New Zealand. And while I was in New Zealand, I had some friends there that I had met in conferences. When you go to a conference, you meet people from all over the world. They're Maoris. The Maoris call themselves black men. They got tremendous gangs there. One gang is called the Mongo Mob, and the other is called the Black Power Gang. And these are not just children. They got young people, but these are adult men, 35 to 50. They look something like hell's angels, but they call themselves the Black Power Gang is the biggest. The second gang is the Mongo Mob, and they fight and kill one another. So when I got to New Zealand, my friend, who was one of the Maori liberation struggles, they're trying to kick the white man out of New Zealand because he came there and conquered their land and tried to destroy all of them as a people. But they came back. And so when I got there, and I'm going to go through this quickly, so follow me. They, um, first, the custom people were hesitant to let me in. But finally, I got through customs because the American security people called them and said that this black Muslim is coming there. He's going to create some problems for you, so watch him. So when I got there, I went on a radio show. I had done a radio show and a, a newspaper interview and a TV show. But on this radio show, I was explaining to the people about the Nation of Islam, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and how it started. So two people called, a lot of people called, but two people very important. One of them belonged to a group called the Ratnas. And Ratna was a nationalist group that started in um, New Zealand where they were trying to regain their heritage and their strength at the turn of the century. Uh, T.R. Ratner died. And the man that called in said that, I think that the Ratner movement started the Nation of Islam. And one of our members went to America and started your movement. And I'm saying this because we saw a picture of your leader, Elijah Muhammad, with our sign on his head. And the star and crescent that you use is the sign of our movement. So I told the man that I'd like to meet with him at the home that I was staying uh, off the air and talk about it. Then a gang member called. The leader of the Black Power Gang called. He said, I've been listening to this uh, black man from America, and I want you to come over and talk to our gang. And uh, he's, I told him that I had to get off the air because I was going to a Juma prayer, and I was the speaker at a Juma prayer at a mosque there. And I told him to meet me at the mosque. And when I got to the mosque, this was the same afternoon, he was standing outside, leather jacket, tattooed face, awesome kind of figure. And everybody fears the gangs there. And so he said, are you uh, this Akbar Muhammad I heard on the radio? I said, yes. He said, what is this place? I said, it's called a mosque. He said, I never heard of that. What are they doing there? I said, these people are called Muslims. Their religion is Islam. He said, I never heard of that. So he said, well, why don't you come and address our gang? We want to set up so you can talk. I heard you talking strong about the black man, and we are black people. And they look like American Indians, but they call themselves black people. So I call all crazy people. I said, fine, I will do that. 
Then that night, this man who belonged to the Ratness came. Now listen to how interesting this is. He came and he brought me pictures. And uh, he showed me that they had the Star and Crescent. And he told me about their leader. So I said, did your leader ever travel? He said he made a trip around the world in 1898. I said, where did he go? He said uh, he went to countries. He named some of the countries he went to. And uh, I said, that's interesting. So I listened to him carefully. And he was sure that one of their members went to America, came to California. This is where Hearst got this whole story from. Hearst said that this man that they called, uh, trying to say that he was the savior, Master Farad Muhammad, called Wallace Ford, and they showed this picture of him looking like a convict. They said that, and remember, if you remember the article in 1963, they said that his mother was from New Zealand. Right. Didn't they say that? So he said that one of our members started your group. And I listened to him. I let him talk all the way out. And then I said, let me tell you something, my brother. I said, I appreciate what you said. Then he gave me the ring. And their ring has a star and a crescent and their pen. So I took the sign. I said, you see this sign? And then he showed me one of their old books. Their old book had a flag just like our flag. That was their first flag. And so I began to tell him, I said, that see, what your leader got is the flag of Islam. I said, then even though, you know, you give him credit as starting, but Islam has been around a long time. I said, perhaps when your leader traveled around the world, you said he went to Egypt and Syria. And maybe when he was in Egypt and Syria, he came in contact with Muslims. And he saw the dynamic force of Islam, but he knew that you were brought up on Christianity and he wanted to maintain the spiritual base, so he came back and gave you Islam. I said, look at the way your women dress. Their women dressed in long dresses and headpieces look just like our sisters. I said, and look at the um, lodges where you meet, you call them lodges, but they have minarets that look something like a mosque. I said, in our history, there was a man named Marcus Garvey. He was born on the island of Jamaica. He went to England. And he worked in a shop in England with a, a, a Muslim named Muhammad Dus. He was a Palestinian. This Palestinian taught him Islam and gave him the feel of nationalism. Marcus Garvey had a love of his people and he went back to teach, but he didn't teach him Islam because he felt that they couldn't accept it. So in the UNIA, he, needed, he knew that they needed a spiritual base, so he let Christianity continue, but at the base of his thinking was Islam. And I told the man, I said, that I think that T.R. Ratner did the same thing. Right. I said, no, your, one of your members didn't start the Nation of Islam. I said, you may have heard that a lie that Hearst Press put out to try to stop the Nation of Islam in 1963 because of its tremendous influence in the black community. I said, but our savior came from the holy city of Mecca, and he established Islam among black people in North America. And from that, Sister Tynetta went back to New Zealand and was able to teach this people. So I'm saying, that it shows you the influence and the power of Islam, even though they don't have the name on it of what it is, it has a power and an influence in society, and it has influenced those people in New Zealand. So it is in North America today. There are many brothers and sisters who are out there in the street who are not here in the mosque with you, but they are under the influence of Islam as taught by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan today. And that that influence and that knowledge that's in the street, they're going to use it in their organization. We can't get uptight. Huey Newton and the Black Panther Party. Uh, Elaine Brown's book is out. There's only one distortion in her book about that meeting at Huey's apartment where she said Minister Farrakhan came in and they searched him. And the question is, I was there at the meeting. And if I see Elaine, I'm going to say, Elaine, that's not exactly what happened. The only reason that the minister submitted to let Huey's people search him because the minister knew they were copying off us. The messenger did spank him and tell him, you shouldn't have let him search you. You know, don't have to go there. And those who were around at that time, you remember that. It was uh, Brother uh, Edward uh, Rashid, Ali Rashid, who reported it to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. God rest him in peace. But he was the one that reported, and it was how the report that was brought to him is how the Honorable Elijah Muhammad reacted. But Minister Farrakhan submitted to the search only because, he said, I know they got this from us. The Panthers Party's base was from the Nation of Islam. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad never attacked the Panther Party because he knew that they were people that were operating from his base. So there'll be many brothers in the street who will operate from the base of what Minister Farrakhan is teaching. We don't have to attack them, let them grow, because eventually they will come to where you are today.
Brothers and sisters, the last part of this that I want to share with you. As most of the members in the Nation of Islam know that uh, I had a heart problem. And sometimes when you hear people have heart problems, you wonder uh, about them. And I know that uh, I got Brother James Muhammad, who is traveling with me from New York, and who will be working with us in Ghana. And he's like a, a monitor because uh, I'm only supposed to talk an hour, no more than an hour and a half lecture for 45 minutes. But you know how it is when you get on this roster and get wound up. And I know he's back there about to pass me a note. But I just want to share this last part, and I'm going to close the meeting out. And uh, we haven't given out the forms yet. They're ready to be given out. I want to close out this last uh, part of the meeting. Um, in 1987, I, had, I was in New York, and I was going to take over the mosque in New York. Minister Farrakhan had sent me there. And one night, I had a heart attack. And, um, and that heart attack resulted in me having open heart surgery in July of that year. And after I had the open heart surgery, my real job was to kind of take it easy a little. And being a workaholic, and I'm really a workaholic, and uh, I thought that that used to be a terminology that people used. And I used to always think that it was just a bunch of lazy Negroes that called people who worked hard workaholics, you know, who really didn't want to do any work. But I found out there is such thing as a workaholic. My daughter says that, Daddy, you're the kind of man that even if there's no work to do, you create work to do because you are a bona fide workaholic. And I've been that way in my 30-some-odd years in the Nation of Islam. Brother Malik Farrakhan can bear witness. They were in Ghana. They was on a roll every day. We had a public enemy going. And I remember when uh, Dion Warwick and Isaac Hayes were there, they had a very tight schedule. They were only there six days. So one morning, Dion said that, look, he said, you, you represent a new kind of slave master. <laughs> But it's so, it's so much to see and so little time to see it. But uh, on the July, uh, January, excuse me, the 22nd, I went to a place in the north of Ghana. Public Enemy had just left. They had stayed there, I think, about uh, nine days. Is that right, Brother Malik? And they had left, and the inauguration of the president was coming up. So Minister Farrakhan sent his wife, Sister Khadija Muhammad, the chief of staff, Brother Lennon Farrakhan Muhammad, uh, his wife, Donna Farrakhan Muhammad, and daughter of Minister Farrakhan, and the editor of the paper to cover the inauguration of President uh, Jerry Rollins. So we had a, a very tight schedule. So after the inauguration, I had some speaking engagements in uh, Tamale, which is a Muslim stronghold in the north of the country. So the president, in a meeting with him, he said, well, I would like you all to fly instead of going on the road. He gave us a plane, flew us up there. But the students in Tamale, after we spoke that Friday, we spoke at the two largest mosques, at the Juma Prayer. I spoke at the one that had about 5,000 people, and Brother Leonard, I had to put him into his ministerial road. I sent him to the other mosque that had about 2,000 people. So the next day, I was supposed to speak at a university, and the president was sending a plane to pick us up that night to take us back to Accra. And uh, I told the students I would stay over and take a bus back, which is about a 14-hour bus ride. And it's not like the road from here to San Diego, believe me when I tell you. So uh, uh, Brother Leonard went to the students and told the students that, look, this man got a heart problem. I didn't even know he was telling them this, because I don't tell people. I don't like to talk about a heart problem, because when people say you got a heart problem, they don't know whether they should hold your hand. They say, oh, sit down over here, heart problem, you know what I mean? So I don't even mention it. I don't even talk about it. So he went and told him behind my back that, look, this man got a heart problem. He cannot sit on the bus for 15 hours back to Accra. He has to get on that plane tonight that the president is sending here to pick us up. And why don't you bring the students over here to the compound and let him teach the students here, round up all that you can. So the student leader came to me and said, look, uh, Brother Akbar, we would really like you to get on the plane when it comes and fly back to Accra and we'll go get the students. I said, no, I promised the students I'd be at the university. I'll stay. He insisted. So they went and got everybody, rounding them up. So I delivered a lecture to the students at the compound. We flew back on the plane that night. I saw the uh, minister's delegation off to their hotel, and I went home, and about 2 o'clock in the morning, I woke up with some sharp chest pain. Now, I, just, I was hoping that it was just some angina from uh, working hard all day. And, uh, and so I laid there for a minute, and then I went to move, and I couldn't move, and I was losing my breath. And being a heart patient, I knew what that meant. So I got my briefcase, turned it upside down, found my nitroglycerin tablets, opened it, put two under my tongue, but I didn't feel anything. I did not know that once you open nitroglycerins and use one three months later, they lose their strength. 
And so then my breath is done. So I woke my wife up. I said, look, I said, I got a problem. I think I'm having a, another heart attack. She said, oh, she used another word, one of, them, one of the choice words that sisters use when they get upset. <laughs> and then she called a friend of ours, and he rushed over to the house. It was about 2.30. We got to the hospital about 3 o'clock. And after we went through some changes at the hospital, I saw a doctor explain to him. The doctor said, yeah, he said, uh, I know what you need, but we don't have no medicine. And uh, we don't have no oxygen. And uh, so he said, but well, we can keep you here in the morning. We may be able to get some in the morning. And he showed me this room where they were going to keep me. I said, if I go in there, I'll surely die. So I'm sitting there. I said, well, I said, well, Allah, well, maybe you want me to die here in Africa. And I was about to accept my fate. So they said, look, we got to get some medicine. So we tried to get to a doctor. He was called away on emergency to the military hospital. We went to the pharmacist. We couldn't get nothing at the pharmacy. So they went to a clinic, woke up a doctor at the clinic. And then he tells me he didn't have the medicine I needed. And uh, he said, it's difficult to get it in Accra sometime. But he said, I do have some oxygen. And I got something else that I may be able to give you a shot that will help maybe open the, the uh, you know, the arteries up, the vessels up. And then in the morning, maybe we can do something. So he put me in a room, gave me some oxygen that allowed me to breathe. And if anyone is in here that's a heart patient or had a problem with the heart, you know what kind of pain it is. It's, it's tremendous pain. But the worst thing is that you can't breathe. You lose your breath. It's very short. So they put me in a room, he gave me the shot, and the next morning they contacted the president and took me over to a hospital and they took care of me. I stayed in the hospital seven days on the medicine, but they could not do the procedure, the catheterization there, because they didn't have everything and they had to get me back to America. And they had a big debate whether I could fly or not fly. One doctor said, this man cannot fly, it's too serious. And the other doctor said, he got to go so that he can get into a hospital in America. And so the president uh, sent his personal doctor over and said that he would put a doctor on the plane and get me back to America. So the doctor said they opted that I would stay in the hospital seven days on medication that they have, and then I would stay home seven days and then try to get a flight to America. I flew to Chicago and got into a hospital, and that's why I'm back in America now. And I uh, thank Allah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when I was in the hospital, I found out the things that they didn't have. And being that they saved my life, I pledged that I would come back and try to do something to help the hospital. And one thing that we're doing is none of the doctors had doctor's jackets. And so I want to get them all doctor's jackets so they look like doctors. So I asked the doctor, the head doctor there at the hospital, I said, how come the doctors don't have doctor's jackets on so that they look like doctors? He said, well, look, Akbar, if we had to make a choice to buy doctor's jackets or medicine, we would buy the medicine. You see, in your case, we didn't even have no medicine. And so it's not big things. You don't have to do grand things in Africa. It's small things that you can do that can make a difference. So I pledged that I would work on doing that. And so as I got back to America, I'm on this tour across the country. Um, I've spoken in Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Atlanta, Miami. Uh, I'm here today. I'll be in San Diego tomorrow night. And I'm trying to take it easy on the road, Brother Malik. You know, I, I'm trying to get my rest. And the minister, Thursday night at his house, when we had a full discussion about Ghana, he didn't want me to visit any more cities after I finished these current cities that I have to go to. But he's going to do a national hookup across the country and let me talk to the whole country. And he asked me to do this hookup. There's three things that I want to talk about. One thing is our convention. We're going to give out forms. And Brother James, if we could have the brothers in the back to give out the forms, to everyone, uh, the, the Savior's Day in Ghana and take questions from across the country. I have to do that because it's important that the Muslims prepare for this. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, when he told me that he wanted to do a convention in Ghana, he said, how many people can we take, Akbar? I said, Brother Minister, to be safe, we can take about 1,500. He said, Brother, you think we can make it 3,000? And I said, yes, sir. I said, if you want it, Brother Minister, we will make it 3,000. And so that means that we'll have every hotel in our crowd booked up, small and large. That means that we will tie up the airlines. I asked him about charters. He does not want us to take charters. So we have to get 80% on the planes that go and stagger the leaving. We can charter out of Europe or out of Cairo, but he doesn't want to take a charter leaving America because he feels that the enemy may try to do some sabotage. He may sacrifice six or 12 of his to get 385 of ours. So we're not going to do a charter at this point unless the minister has a change of heart about it. But that's one thing I want to do. The second thing, I want to talk about the work in Ghana and how I feel 
that this African mission, we only in one country, Africa has 52 countries on the continent, and then there's some islands around it, another four, making about 54 countries. But I feel that our young people will have an, an opportunity to go live and work in Africa for a period of time, such as the Peace Corps, and it can help develop focus in their own life when they see people with much less than they have and how we can work out there. This has to be a marriage between the Africans and the black Americans. Right. And that is a getting to know one another because there's been an enemy in between us and we don't know. And the third thing that I'm doing as I go around the country is there's a book that I'm encouraging the Muslims to read because I was on a radio show in New York, a very popular radio show. Thank you. And uh, I got a call about, I was encouraging everyone to get the Savior's Day uh, videotape. Not just to hear the lecture, but to see the tape. Because Minister Farrakhan brought up the wives of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And the big controversy over them trying to make the Honorable Elijah Muhammad other than a righteous man through the wives given to him by God. And so Muslims who have to answer that and deal with it, they have to have a, a sufficient knowledge base to answer those questions intelligently. So there's two aspects of it. To know the history of the nation is one, but to know the history of Prophet Muhammad of 1400 years ago and his life dealing with the wives that are mentioned in the Holy Quran. As Muslims, we are permitted wives. The Holy Quran says four, but it says also you should treat them equally, which is almost impossible. And then the Quran says one is better if you but knew. Now this black man in America, I bear witness, one is enough for you right now. And, and, uh, and, and all I got to do is ask the sister, dealing with one wife is enough, and that's the discipline that you have to develop, and that's the discipline that we preach in the nation of Islam. And the black woman has to feel secure in her man. But you have to know the history of the uh, wives of the prophet because you're a Muslim and people will ask you questions and you should be able to answer them with an intelligent knowledge base about it. So as I go around the country, I am promoting a book that I read in 1983 when I was sitting in Libya for 33 days waiting to see Gaddafi. I read this book. And even though, you know, I have uh, done a lot of reading on Islamic uh, literature, this sister, a woman wrote this book, an Egyptian woman. But what she did is she brought the human aspect into the how difficult it was for even Prophet Muhammad to have more than one wife. And it's a chore. And she brought the human element in it. And you have to understand that in de defending the life of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that the enemy wants to use to attack the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as all of the Christian scholars who wanted to attack Islam used that to attack the life of Prophet Muhammad 1400 years ago. So when I called Indianapolis to a big importer of Islamic literature to get this book, they said that they were out waiting for a shipment, but I had some through my business. But as I go around the country, I'm promoting that the Muslims need to get the book, and if you have a copy, fine, pass it around and read it. That gives you a sufficient knowledge base. You need to study the Holy Quran. Don't just have a Holy Quran that you got at home, and you, and you hold it up when you want to look pious. You know, a jackass carrying books, he's still a jackass. You can load a jackass down with books, and when you take the books off the jackass's back, he's still a jackass. And in the old days, I remember when I grew up in the church, they used to say, sleep on the Bible. Like through osmosis, the wisdom of the Bible was going to go into your brain. That's crazy as hell. If you don't open the Bible and read it, then there ain't nothing in that Bible going in your brain. I don't care how many nights you sleep on it. And if you think I'm lying, you try it. Sleep on it and see if it goes in your brain. That's crazy. You got to open the book. Don't have a bookshelf in your house with books on it that you sit up there to look pretty. You got to go into those books. You have a very knowledgeable minister here who can teach you, but you can't just depend on what comes off the roster. You have to do some independent studying so that as you interact with people that you can talk with them intelligently. When I became a Muslim, I first went to the mosque uh, February the 15th, 1960. It was the first day I went to a Muhammad's mosque in New York City. And I went there because I had read a little article in the paper about a man named Malcolm X. And when I went and became a Muslim, in my neighborhood in New York, I was called Muslim Larry because there was no other Muslims around. But the minute you hear Islam, to all of our new brothers, as soon as you hit the street, somebody will say, assalamu alaikum to you. There's Muslims everywhere, of every caliber, every kind. So therefore, you have to have a different knowledge base today than what you had years ago. 
And so therefore, and, and even if you don't stay with us, you come and you hear and you got something else on your mind, at least what you learn here will enable you to deal on your own when you go on that street, but you must do some studying yourself. So as I go around the country, there's two things that I encourage the believers to do, is to get those tapes of Brother Minister Farrakhan. That second tape is a very important tape, and you got to listen to it. The videotape of the Savior's Day is important. If they have it here, you need to get the tape, because the minister in the tape gives you a sufficient knowledge base that as people talk to you about the life of Malcolm, don't forget, it hasn't hit the video shops yet, and hit TV, it'll be on TV, and the questions will continue to come up about the life of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Did the Muslims kill Malcolm X? Why did they kill him? Why did Malcolm leave the nation? The minister lays the base for you beautifully, then you have to do some independent study in yourself. There's a proliferation of books on the nation of Islam. I got a call 5 o'clock, 445 Thursday morning, that Captain Yusuf Shah, the captain that I came up in the nation under, and Minister Farrakhan came up, and that he passed away. And Shah, known, if you read Malcolm's biography, he talks about Joseph X. That was the captain in New York City that we came up under. That's right. And he passed away, and the thing about it, you never know what tomorrow will bring. I talked to him, he called, he heard I had another heart attack, and he called me. I talked to him and his wife, and I told him I was coming to New York to teach, and I would call him when I got to New York. I got to New York and got busy. I did not call him to meet with him, and now I will never meet with him. And it shows you that don't take things for granted. Even a promise that you make to your brother or sister. Don't take each other for granted that you will always see them the next day. Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. After this happened, I called the minister that morning and told him of the tragic news that Captain Shaw had died of a massive heart attack at 3 o'clock that morning. That afternoon, I was calling the minister's house because I had a meeting with him and my whole family was in Chicago to discuss the Ghana mission and how we would move. Then I called the house, and the minister's secretary was very sad. And I said, well, I don't know why she's so sad. You know, she said, haven't you heard? I said to myself, she didn't know Captain Shaw. But Aaron, young Aaron, who worked with Hakeem, the uh, son of Salim Muhammad, who was the captain in San Diego, and the son of Celeste Muhammad, who was the minister's personal cook, had died in his room in South Carolina on a college camp. 19 years old. Very, very hard day. This was all of this happened one day, April the 1st. And uh, when we got that tragic news, you know, we have to come to grips with that. Minister Farrakhan told me that evening. He said, I just saw him 10 days ago. Just gave him the greetings. He was on spring break and saw him off back to college. And now the young boy is gone. We don't know the circumstances of his death right now. Uh, it appears to be that it was suicide. And we are hoping that it is not, but uh, that's what it appears to be. All evidence is pointing to that. And it shows you that you never know what's on young people's mind. Don't take them for granted. And I'm saying, and I'm appealing to parents. You know, one thing that I respect about the Kennedy family, Joseph Kennedy made his dinner table a classroom. And he spent quality time with his children. And I'm saying to all of the brothers, if I could do what I have done with my family again, with all of my daughters, my eight daughters, I would sp have spent more time. When I came up in the nation, I mean, I know the first day that I missed a meeting at the mosque. I was there every time the door opened. I got on the roster because Malcolm said the top paper seller in the mosque will open up for me. And I became the top paper seller for three years running. I was selling more papers than all the brothers in the mosque. But I never missed a mosque meeting. But And I was known as a hardcore soldier all of my life in the nation, but I neglected. That wasn't balanced. I never ate dinner with my children. I never got home. When I got home at night, I had a, uh, and have to this day a beautiful wife. She would wait up for me, fix my food, have my bean soup and my toast ready for me. Late at night when I come in, eating late at night and going to bed, getting up early in the morning, saying my prayers and getting back out there soldiering before I got the subway to go to work. But I never spent quality time with my children. Never set them down at a table. I grew up. I've, I've done it now. I started in 1986. And we used to have sessions at the table. But look how long it took me. 1986. And my daughters were practically all grown by that time. Five of them graduated from college. And I thought that that, well, I worked hard and 
accumulated money, sent them all to school, made sure they had a decent education. The other three, I hope that they will finish college. But I didn't spend the thing that I read in one of those Kennedy biographies, what Joseph Kennedy did for his boys. He endeared greatness to them at that dinner table. He made them to ask questions. And you have to give them your life experience. If you don't want to do it in the first person system, do it in the second person. If there's things in your life you may be a little ashamed of, and all of us got some skeletons or things that we don't necessarily want our children to know about, then do it in the third person. But at least teach them. That's the value of history. That's my subject for the day. Those who fail to learn the lesson of history are doomed to repeat it. Sit these young men down at the table. And brothers, even if you're not with your son, but you know he's growing up in that jungle out there, sit him down and talk to him about the rigors of life. You know, no man wants to go to his grave being a zero. Right. Right. Hardest job for a Negro preacher is to find something good to say about a Negro that has done nothing all of his life. Hello. You know, he makes up stories about him. Yeah, he was a good man knowing that he was nothing but a bum. Gave everybody that came across his way nothing but a problem. Yeah, we see him going into the holy gates. We see the Jesus opening the gates from knowing that that Negro haven't done a doggone thing to be a problem for everybody in his life. I mean, and look, all of us going to lay there. All of us going to lay out in that coffin. And so what you got to say is what do I want to be? And we have to do this for our young people. So, I, I mean, I'm saying that because it's important. If I can say anything to the Muslim community, we have to have continuity. I don't want my granddaughters to say we rebuilding the nation of Islam. We want the nation of Islam to have continuity and continuation. And the only way we can do it is to instill that value in those children. And so we got to spend some time with them. It's very important. So I just wanted to say that in, in my conclusion, that let's study and get the kind of knowledge base that's necessary so that the nation can go on. Now, I'm going to try to do this quickly. Only the travel letter has been distributed. This is the travel letter. Now, what we need for 1994, we need your deposit. But more than your deposit, we need your name and address if you intend to go. I hope that even if you can't see getting the money. Now, I know there's all kind of people who got different travel plans and people who want to go to Ghana and uh, say that I know how to get there cheaper. This is not, you know, we're going to stay six stacked to the room, the FOI, you understand, and we're going to do it our way. This, this is a different ball game. And if you don't believe it's a different ball game, check with Yusuf and Malik and Brother Cornelius. They've been to Africa and they've been to Ghana, okay? So it's a different ball game. You're not going to do it like we'll rent a car when we get to our crowd, Brother Akbar. You just give us a brother to show us around. We'll handle everything. Yeah? You find out when you get there. Number one, when you rent the car, you rent it with a driver. Number two, the cars in Ghana, the rental car, is even more expensive than in America. Number three, the roads are not like the roads here. Number four, when you get to the hotel, now you say, I found a fare to Ghana from Los Angeles, California, on KLM, British Air, and Swiss Air for exactly $1,800. Unless, and so you get there and then you got to get a hotel. We're going to have all the hotels booked up anyway, so they're going to send you back to us anyway. Okay, so then you have to get a hotel. Then after you get the hotel, you have to have ground transportation to get around. Then you have to eat every day unless you're a breatharian or you're going to fast for 11 days, okay? <laughs> so whichever way it goes, you got to do something like that. So when you look at the price, don't let the price fight. We, we did add a small cushion to each fare because it's 1994 and we have to play it on the safe side. You can transfer your money, you can get a refund up until January 1994. After January, you can only transfer it to someone else's name because we have to give the airlines a substantial deposit as well as the hotel and ground transportation. Uh, on the form, you will see that we work the children's fair. Now, there is an area that is not clear if you have three children that you're taking. And I recommend children under seven not go, but some people uh, feel that they have to take their children. They have no babysitter. Some of them want their children to have this African experience, and I applaud that. Brother Cornelius took his son, uh, and I think that it made a difference in little Cornelius Jr.'s life just to make that trip. But you want to take your children, if you have the money to do it, fine. And you said, and I can't leave my children in America with nobody for 11 days, you have to take them, fine. You should take them. But you have to just make sure that you do that. There's an area that's not clear, and that's the area, if you have three children you're taking and they're going to stay in the same room with your husband and yourself, what would your rate be? We'll have to work that out once I get back to Ghana. Inshallah, I hope to leave for Ghana later this month. But what we need from you, we, need, we extended the deposit date so that I can make this tour across the country. But we need your name and address if you intend to go. 
We need to compile the list. Now, in two editions from this edition that's out of the final call, this same form is going to be in the paper, and it's going to be opened up to the general public. So we're trying to get as many brothers and sisters who come to the mosque, who may not be registered, or Muslims who want to go, get them on the uh, list first. Because once we reach a certain figure, then it's cut off. And even if you say, well, I'm not going with you, I'm going on my own, then you're still going to have a problem when you get to Ghana, and you'll see what I mean when you attempt it. So I would recommend that you work with us. Now, I know that there are many who have relatives that work for the airlines, and you're going to get an uh, uh, ID, what is it, an ID-90? And, okay, you're going to get an ID-90, and it costs a, a discount, and it's going to cost $290 to fly to Accra. I know exactly what it costs, but you got some other kind of problems with that. But if you want to work it out, we want to help you to do it. We want you to get there. So if you say, well, I only want to pay for the ground arrangements, I'll get there on my own. I just want you to be careful because the flights don't fly every hour or every day, okay? Like if you go to Cairo, Egypt, and you miss that flight on Monday morning that you took, Brother Malik or Brother Kanir, you only have to wait seven days for the next flight. The next one flies next Monday. Okay, you'll be over at my house asking me, can I camp out for seven days because you, you ran out of money and don't have enough money for the hotel. So, and the other flights fly every three days or, or three times a week, excuse me, and some twice a week. So, and if you're on standby, being that we got all the seats booked, and you know if you're on the ID-90, you definitely have to stand by until everybody's on the flight and hold your baggage to the last minute. In international travel on the African continent, it does not work the same way in Europe or America. So I just want to make you familiar with that, okay? If you want to use your I-90 and come over in an off-season, that's fine. But during the convention, I don't recommend it unless you're very adventurous and you're going to carry all your luggage. There's two other ways that you can go to Ghana that's much cheaper. Thank you, Brother Minister. One is you take Air Freak out of New York. It flies to Dakar, Senegal. It stops there. You get off the plane, get back on, fly to Abidjan and Cote d'Ivoire, and then you take a smaller plane to Accra. Susan Taylor, Gary Bird of Essence Magazine tried that. And if you think that that uh, is good, call them and ask them, okay? I don't recommend it for anybody. The other way is for you to take uh, Nigerian Airways into Lagos. Now, I love my Nigerian brothers, but they got a set of problems that I don't think that you want to encounter. And if you can carry all your luggage on, if you just got hand luggage, then take that route. It only costs you $978 round trip. But when you get to Lagos, you got to wait for a smaller plane to get over to Accra, Ghana, where you're coming for the conference. And they cancel them every day. So you usually sleep in the airport in Lagos with your luggage, because usually it's very difficult to get out of the airport. And you don't have a visa for Nigeria. So these are the kind of problems that you encounter. So please, let me help you, okay? And I know, I know you want to put together your own package and do it your own way. And uh, you're grown, you're adults. I cannot stop you. Do it that way if you feel you just have to do it that way. But uh, uh, I can help you. We'll get some tents at my house because I only have a limited amount of, of uh, bedrooms. Is that right, Malik? And then I'll let you camp out. I got a big lawn, though. And I will make sure that you camp out on my lawn as you stay in there trying to get out of our crowd Ghana to get back to the white man's job. So if you would help us out, fill out the form for us so we can at least get your name and address. If you don't want to fill it out today, just get it, fill it out, and mail it to the address on it as soon as possible because we're trying to get the figures. We need your deposit by the 15th of May. You can send your deposit in now. We've already got a load in. And, uh, and if you want to go with the savings plan, fine. One sister called me and said that, Brother Akbar, I want to go with the savings plan, but I want you to pay me interest on the money. I said, I'll tell you what you do, sister. You save it in your bank account, and you earn the interest. Just send me the complete check by August the 1st, 1994. You know, you don't have to save it with me if you got the discipline. Usually people put it into a savings plan because they put it in the bank. you got all kind of pressure on that money, and all kind of emergencies come up. But if an emergency come up and we have it in our account for the savings day, and it's, you can't make the withdrawal that you can in your local account. That's the only difference. But if you have the discipline, save it and earn the interest yourself. And just when the deadline comes, just send a certified check for the full amount. You don't have to use the savings plan. You can use a credit card. You can use a credit card for your down payment. You can use a credit card to pay it all off. You can use extended payment on American Express. We're trying to set it up to use Discovery, Diners, and all of the cards that are available. Right now, we're just taking Master, Visa, and American Express. We're going to try to set it up. It's not difficult so you can use your credit card. 
but and also I'm encouraging the believers as I travel around the country to do some extra work maybe to earn some extra money so you can begin to prepare for the trip. As soon as we get your deposit, we will send you out a complete booklet that tells you about the shots you need. Now we have some brothers and sisters that don't want to take any shots and uh, they want to build up on herbs and you know and natural things, but it's a problem because in order to get in the country you have to have your immunization card, that's your yellow card. And if you've got a doctor that you know, let the doctor, you can hire a black doctor that you know. If you think that the clinic may have something in the medicine, you don't trust the white man, then get a black doctor, let him come to the mosque and get your shots right here. That's all, and you uh, range your feet. Yes, brother. We need to go get the shots because the doctor is trying to find out what's that way in, man. Because most of the small doctors, the black doctors, are white. They don't carry that particular medication. You need for the shot. Thank you. Thank you. That's what we get it at the clinic. So I'm saying that, and don't wait. How many brothers and sisters in here have a passport? Okay. How many do not have a passport? Okay. That's just about everybody. So, and, and the reason you don't have it, because you had no need for it. You weren't going to Japan or Australia or Tahiti or somewhere. So now that we've gone to Africa, you have a need for it, and please start processing now. Some of you have birth certificate problems and so forth. It costs $60 to get a passport. When I got my passport, it costs exactly $8. The government has made a business out of it. So you have to work on your passport right now. You should have one anyway. We might have to make a quick escape. So, uh, so make sure that you uh, work, start working on your passport right now. Also, the second sheet that you have, they gave these sheets out, is information on the Ghana mission, how you can send stuff to us in Ghana, and I want to just say this, and I know I'm running way over my time, but um, the Japanese after World War II, they started a pen pal with their young people. And their young people did a pen pal, because I belonged to the Japanese pen pal. When I first became a Muslim, I used to take the Muhammad speaks that I didn't sell instead of stacking them, and my wife telling me to move them out of this room and that room. And those have been around a long time, you understand that. We used to, I used to mail them overseas through the Japanese pen pal. And it's a way to communicate, starting with the children in the university, as uh, Minister Ave Muhammad and with Brother Daniel's uh, help here has started a pen pal for our students. Then you contact people all over the world, and as these students grow up, they become friends in other countries that can end up as business associates. They can help them when they travel to those countries, when they come here, and it, it's a, what you call a synergistical value to doing that at a young age, starting a pen pal. So we need, in Ghana, what I need is used black books, uh, stationery, pens, and pencils, so that when we go to the villages, we can give them out. And it shows you on this slip how to mail it to us in Ghana. OK? I just want to mention a few more things, and then we're going to start. I'm going to be the auctioneer today, but I can't get pumped up like I used to do in New York because I got this problem. But I'm, we have a few items that we want to help you. We want you to help the Ghana mission with the permission of your minister, that's what we're doing around the country. And I must say, in Atlanta, Georgia, Brother James and myself, we had to hold back the African carvings because the Atlanta mosque wanted to buy them all up. They bid it on everything, and they pleaded with us to bid for more, and we said we couldn't do it because I was coming here to Los Angeles, and I had to save a few pieces for Los Angeles. All praise to Allah. I want to mention also that Public Enemy was in Ghana, and, it, and they told me that it was the best trip they ever made. I mean, Flavor Flay brought so much stuff he had to send to America for money. They came in with 48 pieces of luggage and left with 92 pieces. I had to negotiate to get it reduced. And then let me just tell you this short story. The best way to tell, to make a story short, you know the best way to make a long story short? Don't tell it, okay? <laughs> but let me, let me do this one real quick. When they got to Cairo, and Malik, I wasn't there, but my daughters told me what happened. The, uh, the uh, Egyptian officials looked at Flavor's passport, and they knew that something was wrong with this group. It's because Flavor probably balls his passport up, puts it in his pocket, but it looked real bad, so they thought it was a forged passport. So they confiscated all of the passports and said, you pick them up in America. So in other words, because there's a lot of forged passports, American passports, because they're like gold. If you, if you go to Hong Kong right now, you can sell American passports from anywhere from three to $10,000 because when Hong Kong reverts to mainland China, a lot of the uh, people who live in Hong Kong are trying to get to America. So uh, a lot of forged passports around the world, because they think that the streets here are paved with gold. And uh, so they took the passports. And what happened, 
was when they got off the plane in New York and the customs officials got it and found out it was public enemy, one of them white boys said, public enemy, why my children love you guys? And walked them all through, did y'all open one piece of baggage? They didn't open 92 pieces of luggage. And I was trying to gear Chuck and, and Brother James them, I said, now look, y'all gonna pay some heavy duty when you get to New York. And I was telling them what to say and how to bring it down. But the Egyptians thought that they were hurting them and they ended up helping the brothers and they walked through with 92 pieces of luggage and the customs officials didn't open one piece and they didn't pay one dime in duty. All praise to our Allah. Okay, timekeeper is up here. Let me, Public Enemy gave us tapes, their tapes. They said, Brother Akbar, we want to give you our tapes for the Ghana mission. And when I was in New York last week, uh, Brother James gave us a very valuable uh, piece, and I said we'd save it for uh, Los Angeles. But they gave us their tapes. Um, and when you purchase a tape, which will be on the table on your way out, the tape, the donation for the Public Enemy tape will go to the Ghana mission. They didn't charge us anything for them. They said, you keep it all for the work that you're doing in Africa, and I want to thank them very much. And, uh, they are a good group. They've been together seven years. And the whole of group, uh, when a rap group can, rap groups have a longevity of three years. After three years, rap groups are gone. And you look, Run DMC, you just look at them. Public Enemy has been there for seven years. And they've been together for seven years, and the whole seven years to hold 12 to 15 brothers together and move on the road around the world is a task. And that's why I always say that Allah is with those brothers. And uh, when they, I, I'm moved by them. I'm very impressed by them. And uh, they are a conscious rap group to wake up our young people. Also, there's another tape on the table. A sister came to Ghana on our first trip and came back when Dionne Warwick was there and she recorded a tape uh, with Osibisa called Welcome Home. She gave us a whole lot of her tapes that were made in Ghana and uh, they were used as the theme song in New York on the radio when Gary Bird was coming to Ghana and her tapes were donated to the Ghana mission that'll be on the table outside. Now, for those brothers and sisters who are going to Ghana, this is the currency of Ghana that y'all got some in the mail from the students and we got some brand new currency and what we want to do is that when you get up in the morning, I want you to hang it somewhere in your house. And you look at it, you say, when I get to Ghana, I'm going to spend this money. And I'm working on getting to Ghana. So we, it has a 1,000 CD note, a 500, and a 200 CD note. And I want Brother Malik to look at it and see the difference of how the money looks when it's there. Because I, before I left Ghana, I went and got some brand new money. But I want you to see it. This is the currency that you will be able to spend once you get to Ghana. Now, they're going to pass some out for you to look at it while I do this auction real quick, okay? So you have to work with me. Don't work with me too hard. And I hope that you will uh, uh, help the Ghana mission. And I want to thank the minister and thank you for your time and your patience this afternoon. And I hope by the permission of Allah that I said something to you that will help you as you move through the rest of your journey in the nation of Islam and helping the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. First of all, I want to say that we have in the back, these are made out of pure silk. Pure, you can get Kenta cloth. This is pure silk. You can get Kenta cloth in Los Angeles. They sell them for about $15. They're not this wide, this thick, and not this well made. It takes, this one takes three days to weave one of them. And it's weave, these come from the Ashanti area, and the colors have a meaning and also the design on it. So one of our sisters, who uh, helped to get Isaac Hayes in stool. This sister gave us the Kenta cloth and this beautiful, the box alone is about a $20 box. It's called the Ashanti Kingdom. And this is an excellent gift. So she donated these to the uh, Ghana mission to help in the work that we're doing in Ghana. And we want to make, we only have a few of them, but we want to make them available to you. So this is pure silk now. You can get Kenta cloth everywhere, but this is a pure silk center, uh, Kenta cloth. Three days weaving in Ghana, and when you feel it, sisters, you'll know the difference from any other kenta cloth that you've seen, okay? So being at the box alone is very expensive, and the kenta cloth itself, I'd like to get an opening bid of this kenta cloth, as Brother James would say, at least of $20. Can I get $20? And if you like the bid, raise your hand. Be careful how you scratch your head, because I'll take that as a bid, okay? I got $20 first on the wall in the back. Do I have $25? 
I got $25 right here. Do I have $30? Do I have $30 for this Kenta Corp? I got $30 right here. Do I have $35? Do I have $35? I got $30 going right here. $30, I got $35. I got $40 on the wall in the back. I got $45 here. I got $45 going once. I got $45 going twice. I got $50 right here. $50 going once. $50 going twice. Sold $50. Let's give them a round of applause. Yes, can I take the mic? Let me do this. Bear with us, hang with us for a minute, brothers and sisters. I'm going to try to do this as quickly as possible. Uh, in Ghana, Brother James, there should be another mass like this back here. I think this is what we asked the Lama. Do we have one more? Oh, it's gone. Okay. Okay, brothers and sisters, uh, the brothers who are leaving, we're going to have acceptance in a minute. Could you just hold your place for a minute? Bear with me. This will only take a few minutes. I'm very fast at this. Uh, in Obori, a village that you'll visit when you get to Ghana, about a half an hour from my home, the brothers up there carve. They, they carve this and they sell these to the people in the city. And if you see the way they carve, it'll fascinate you. So I'd like to open a bid with this. I'm, who would give me $15 for this mass, okay? I got $15. Do I have $20? I got $20. Do I have $25? I got $20 going once. I got $25 right here. I got $25 going once, going twice, sold to the sister for $25. Thank you very much. For the We're going to do this quick so that we can match and set. Two mass matching sets in black wood. Thank you. Can I get $10 for this set? I know I can get $10 for it. I got 10, I got 15, I got, I got 20 right here. I got $20 right here. I got $20, I got 25, I got $30. I got $30 going once. I got $35 right here. I got $35 going once. $35 going twice. I got, what did we raise it? I thought that was $40. Say what? We're taking checks and we can take credit cards, I think. Can the mom take credit cards? Checks made out the Ghana Mission. Only checks made out the Ghana Mission, and of course we take cash. How about CDs? <laughs> I, I'm at $35. Is it $35 right here? I got $35 going once, $35 going twice. I got $40 right here. $40. Slam alaikum. How are you? $40 going once, $40 going twice. I got $45 right here. $45. $45 going once, $45 going twice. Sold $45. Thank you. Let's give them a warm round of applause. Okay. I want to move. Well, I mean, it's going to help me with this. Can I get $10 for this piece? I got $10. Do I have $15? I got $15. Do I have $20? I got $20 right there. I got $25 on the side. $25. I got $30. I got $35. $35 going once. $35 going twice. Sold at $35. Thank you very much. Sister Joyce. Okay, we only have exactly four pieces left. Four pieces after them. Can I get $10? Do I have 10? I got 10. Do I have 15? $10 going once. I got 15. I, do I have 20? I got $25 right here. $25 going once. $25 going twice. $30. I got $30. I got $30 going once. $35. Do I have? I got, you got the 30. You got it at 30? $30 going once. I got $35 in the front over here. $35 going once, $35 going twice, sold at $35. Thank you very much. If we could get a couple of brothers to assist them, we could make this quick. I want to shake the hands of those who would like to become helpers of Minister Louis Farrakhan and his work of building the Nation of Islam. As soon as we finish this, we're going to do it as quickly as possible. Uh, right here, sister. Here, I need some assistance up here. Sister, right here. Okay, this is a donation for the Ghana mission. I want to thank you very much. Can I get five? I got ten dollars. Can I get ten or oh, five? I got ten dollars. Do I have fifteen? I got I got fifteen in the back. I have twenty. I got twenty dollars. I got twenty-five. I got thirty dollars. I got thirty dollars in the back. I got thirty-five here. Thirty-five going once. 
35, I got $40 in the front over here. $40 going once, going twice, sold at $40. Thank you very much. Okay, we got three pieces left. African wood carvings from Ghana, donation to the Nation of Islam Ghana Mission. Can I get $5 for this piece? I got five. Do I have 10 for it? I got $10 right here. I got 15 in back. I got $15. I got $20 right here. I got $25. I got $25. Going once. Going twice. Sold at $25. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. We got two pieces left. It's a beautiful mass. Can I get $10 for this? $10. Do I say I got $10 right here? $10. $10. I got $15 in the back. $15. I got $20. I got $20 going once. I got $25. Do I have $30? I got 